This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So uh, I'm going to talk about the Mayan Institute, and I have to say it is my favorite topic. I think this is a really special place, and, and it's uh, really just, uh, I still kind of uh, think that they're going to change their mind at some point and say, why did we bring that guy in here? Uh, but it's just, it's just a pleasure, and I, I have fun every day. So a little bit about our history. Uh, we were founded by six families, five of whom have uh, sons with autism. And I think that a lot of their, and, and by founded, I mean uh, that in, a, in many different ways. They were the uh, inspiration for creating the Mayan Institute. They persevered um, to make sure that it happened. The concept of the Mayan Institute in terms of how we're organized and function and even the design of the building really reflects, I think, the, the vision of the families. And I think that that, Kind of, kind of organic origins in families has really made the Mind Institute a special place. And I have to say, um, I was at, as Robin mentioned, as at the University of Wisconsin for 24 years, and um, was very happy there. Maybe not in January and February in Wisconsin, but I was happy the rest of the year. And I really would not have left uh, Wisconsin for any place but the Mayan Institute. And I do think that, w that it's special for many reasons, but I think it's that commitment to families that really makes it different from other places around the country and around the world that on paper look the same in terms of research and clinical care and education and advocacy. So I feel very fortunate uh, to be a part of this uh, wonderful institution. Um, our, uh, we opened as the Research and Assessment Clinic in 1998, um, and then we kind of came into our beautiful new building in 2003, and these are some of the founding families at the uh, groundbreaking. So uh, the vision of the Mayan Institute. The Mayan Institute is a multidisciplinary collaborative center committed to understanding, treating, curing, and preventing neurodevelopmental disorders and improving the lives of people with these disorders and their families. And I think that, again, I think a lot of what we are really reflects that vision of the families. For example, they were very concerned about the rate of progress to understanding the causes of autism and uh, possible treatments. And I think that as they looked at science and how science was happening, they were very concerned that science kind of happened in silos and that different disciplines worked on these problems but really didn't communicate, and they saw that as a hindrance to progress. And so they really wanted to have a place where they brought scientists who were interested in the brain and its development and autism and other conditions and really just kind of broke down the barriers. And it's really interesting as I look at some of our most high-profile pro publications in the, in the area of science, even over the last year or so, and I look at the disciplines represented by the authors of those publications, and very often there's three, four, or five different departments or disciplines represented. And so I think it's a case of where the founding families really got it right, and they were really ahead of the scientists in thinking about how we should work together. Um, and I think the other thing that's important is that um, we, we talk about kind of coming to treatments and cures, but we know that that's a long process. And I think the other part of the Mind Institute that's really critical is represented by our clinics, by the said, and that is that we can't just wait for the future. We can't just kind of keep a single-minded focus on coming up with cures for conditions or treatments that are going to be the ultimate cures. We really need to help families all along the way. And just to kind of give you an example of that, and I'll kind of return to this a little bit later, um, you know, we talk about translational science, and that's the idea of kind of going from discoveries in the laboratory to treatments and cures. And a few years ago, there was an interesting paper in uh, the journal Science, and it was asked the question, how long does translational science take? And they looked at a number of different uh, 
uh, kind of the evolution of a number of different treatments for a variety of physical health conditions. And the first thing that they found was a lot of treatments that get proposed end up not panning out, end up not working. Um, and then for those that work, how long do you think it took to go from kind of the initial proposal to that it's actually on a wide scale use? Just that anyone, how long do you think it takes? Yes. Pretty good, 20 years, is 24 years was the average. And if you think about that, um, and hopefully we can, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, we can decrease that time. But at the same time, I think, you know, I don't want to, you know, meet a family that comes to the Mind Institute and say, it's really nice to meet you, come back in 24 years and we'll have something that will help you. I mean, I think we really have to have this kind of dual commitment to research and helping families now. And that's really what the Mind Institute is about, and it's just uh, really a pleasure to be a part of that. So we are uh, a two-building complex, about 100,000 square feet. Uh, we have 49 faculty. They come from 14 uh, academic departments on the UC Davis uh, Medical School and uh, Davis campuses. And there are four schools or colleges represented, School of Medicine, uh, School of Veterinary Medicine, College of Education, and uh, the College of Letters and Sciences. And just for those of you who aren't familiar with how we're organized, um, so th most of those faculty actually have uh, academic homes elsewhere, even if they have their, their programs of research or their clinical practices at the Mayan Institute, they really kind of report and, and are hired by academic departments, which means, and I learned this, it took me a while to figure this out, but I'm basically the boss of no one at the Mind Institute. Um, and uh, to make it even more uh, interesting, um, I have three bosses that I report to. So that's kind of an odd job, right? So I have three bosses, but I'm the boss of no one. Um, but what it does mean is I think it says something really important about the mission of the Mind Institute. The reason that our faculty commit to what we do, whether it's to be in our building, whether it's to participate in our programs, in our clinical programs, our educational programs, our research, is that they are committed to our mission. And I think that is what really makes it special. It's not that they have to be there because I am the boss of them. It's because they buy into our mission, and I think that makes it really kind of a rich intellectual life. Um, we have a, a budget from the state, an operating budget of about $2.6 million, and that's really only a small part of what we need and, and have to to kind of do our work, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So the Mind Institute is uh, focused on these conditions, um, autism, fragile X syndrome, ADHD, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, Tourette syndrome, and really recently, and we've had interest on, in Down syndrome uh, uh, sporadically in the past, but this is a really, for us, a new growth area. And I just want to talk a little bit about each of these. So autism, obviously, I don't have to say too much about what autism is. And most of you know that the, the most recent evidence, the most recent estimates from the CDC are now that the prevalence of autism is 1 in 88 children. And so this is certainly, um, uh, again, something that our families got right several years ago that we really needed to focus our attention on autism. And I have to say that autism is at the core of our mission and it certainly will be uh, while I'm the director. And what I mean by that is even though we study other conditions, we don't just add conditions to add conditions. We want to be thoughtful about that and with, with our, our kind of our core of autism, then we add other conditions that if we study those conditions, we learn about autism and vice versa. That there has to be a synergy between what we do because what we don't want to do is to create silos within the Mind Institute where we have the Down syndrome program and the Fragile X program and the autism program, we really want people to interact and to have value in studying one condition for other conditions. And I think we really do that. Um, in the area, so Fragile X syndrome is another area of study uh, that is the leading inherited cause of intellectual disability, about one in three to 6,000 children. And one of the reasons that it's interesting in and of itself, it's very interesting, but also about uh, 25 to 30 percent of individuals with Fragile X syndrome, which is caused by a mutation in a single gene, also meet diagnostic criteria for autism. So again, there's overlap, and as you will see a little bit later, there's a lot of insights from Fragile X syndrome that we apply to understanding autism. Um, ADHD is the most common uh, childhood behavioral disorder, and what's really, I think, 
particularly interesting about our program of research is that we recognize that it's a lifelong condition. And oftentimes we kind of focus on children and, and ADHD in the school years, but the truth is it really is a lifelong condition and it affects people in, in often profound ways as adults. So for example, there is an incredibly high rate of auto accidents and job loss among uh, adults who have ADHD. And so this is really a condition that is not just limited to childhood. Uh, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. Um, it's about uh, one in 4,000 children. Um, it's caused by a de novo deletion uh, on uh, chromosome 22. And one of the reasons that it's really important is that it shares other uh, symptoms with uh, autism and the other conditions we're interested in. So uh, developmental delays, a relatively high comorbidity with intellectual disability, uh, attentional problems. And what has drawn a lot of people's interest uh, to 22Q is that uh, it has a high risk for uh, conversion into schizophrenia as well. And so we're also, by studying 22Q, we also learn about schizophrenia and other mental health conditions. Um, Tourette syndrome is a, a motor tic disorder. And that's about three in 1,000 children, um, and uh, it emerges typically in kind of middle childhood, and uh, we know that it's an inherited condition, although we don't really understand the genetics of it very well, um, and we have a really interesting and exciting program of research that's really kind of looking at understanding what causes it and potentially some diagnostic markers. And then Down syndrome. It's so 106, one in 691 children are affected by Down syndrome. And again, I think it's a really interesting uh, part of our mission because I think it really fits well. Um, we, uh, most individuals with Down syndrome have an intellectual disability, so we have that in common with the other conditions. Um, it also contrasts with autism in really interesting ways. Um, although people with um, Down syndrome are generally high in sociability and that they in, in seem to enjoy social interaction, they certainly have uh, social impairments, and at the same time, and this is relatively recent, and this kind of is a confusing picture we haven't quite sorted out, um, a relatively high proportion of people with Down syndrome also meet diagnostic criteria for autism as well. So here you have this sociability in some individuals and what looks like autism in others, so I think it's, there is real interesting potential there uh, for uh, studying that condition. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of our research findings to give you a sense of what we do and how we do our work. Mind scientists are currently conducting um, over 60 funded research projects, and most of our research, I mentioned we have a $2.6 million budget from the state. Most of our research is not funded through that. That really kind of funds some of our basic infrastructure for research, education, and clinical services. Um, we really uh, rely um, on our scientists competing and winning grants and contracts, and the National Institutes of Health is our major source of funding. And so we have about $25 million annually to support our research program um, through the NIH, through Autism Speaks and other private foundations, but NIH is really kind of the, the main source of funding for us. So what I want to just talk about a, a few of our uh, findings, uh, some in some depth, uh, others just to mention the findings, and then get a, I'll give you a sense of other aspects of our mission. So um, many families that have a child with autism want to know what the chances are of having another child with autism. And until just very recently, we haven't had particularly good data on that. Um, the, the best estimates we had at the t a few years ago were that maybe 3 to 10 percent of children who are born into a family that already has a child with autism will meet criteria for autism as well. But that was really based on, on studies that were not very well designed. They weren't using the, kind of the gold standard diagnostic tools for autism. They were small samples and they had other sorts of problems with them. And then in 2011, um, there was a study published, and the lead author was Sally Ozanoff, who's one of our scientists. Um, and uh, she led the Baby Siblings Research Consortium, and this uh, involved 12 sites around the country and the world. Um, and what they did is they had um, uh, two types of families. They had what they called the high-risk families, and these were families that already had uh, a child with diagnosed with autism. And then they had the low-risk uh, families, which were those that had um, didn't have a child with autism. And it was a prospective study, and so that they looked at subsequent children born into the family and looked to see whether they also ended up uh, having a diagnosis of autism. This is the largest sample to date. It was geographically diverse because it was these 12 sites, and they used expert gold standard assessments, and as I mentioned, it was prospective, so they followed these children to see if they ended up with a diagnosis of autism. 
And what they found was a much higher prevalence than other people had thought. Uh, close to 19% when you just averaged across all of these uh, high-risk families, families that already had a child with autism. So the way to think about that is if there was a fam, uh, in these families that already had a child diagnosed with autism, out of every 100 subsequent children born into those families, 19 of them would have autism. Okay, so that's a much higher estimate than previously thought. Uh, but I don't think that really tells the whole story. Uh, there was a kind of differential risk depending on other characteristics of the families. And in particular, if uh, there was a higher risk if the infants born into these families were males and if these were what they called multiplex families. So these were families that had two or more children with autism and then another child was born. And here's uh, just a graph to show you. And I promise I won't show you too many graphs today. And so if you just focus on this bar, just to give you a sense of the differential diagnosis. So if there was a child born into a family that had two or more children with autism already, and that child was male, it was about almost a 50% risk, 50% chance. So half of, those half of those male children born into families ended up having a diagnosis of autism. So on the one hand, I think for many families, I think that that's Concer those are concerning statistics. On the other hand, I think that there's a real positive uh, implication of these, and that is that for pediatricians and other professionals that work with families, I think this tells them that they have to really kind of take a different stance toward looking at these families when a at subsequent children. Rather than taking a wait and see attitude if children in these families uh, have s some sorts of developmental delays, there is a high risk that these children will also end up with an autism diagnosis. And one of the things we know about autism is that we have much better outcomes if we start early intervention, uh, if we start intervention early and it's intense. So early diagnosis is really critical. So this is actually really, I think, an important finding that can really kind of serve as a wake-up call to the, to the professionals who work with families. I just want to talk a little bit about FAXTAS, Fragile X Associated Tremor Ataxia Syndrome. This is a neurological condition that's related in, in many respects to Fragile X Syndrome. Uh, it's caused by the same gene. And this was a condition that was really discovered by um, uh, the, uh, several scientists at the Mayan Institute, Rondi and Paul Hagerman and Flora Tosoni, were really the first to discover this. And it's a neuro uh, neurodegenerative de uh, condition that looks a lot like Parkinson's disease and is often confused with Parkinson's disease, but it has a very different neuropathology and probably, as we learn more, it will re require a different course of treatment. And so the, the issue in Fragile X syndrome is really that on the, uh, there is a gene on the X chromosome that is, uh, includes uh, this trinucleotide sequence that repeats over and over again. Most individuals, those who are uh, neurotypical, have between 5 and 44 of these CGG repeats. Individuals that have Fragile X syndrome have more than 200 of these repeats, and people that, have, uh, that are so-called pre-mutation have between 55 and 200 repeats. And uh, until, really until the work of the Hagermans and, and a few other people around the country uh, a decade or more ago, people used to think that premutation carriers were really unaffected. It turns out now we know that they have a number of conditions, and it's really kind of complicated in the sense that it's not just that they have milder versions of Fragile X syndrome or the symptoms of Fragile X syndrome, they actually have conditions that we don't see in Fragile X syndrome. And one of those is FAXTAS, which as I mentioned is Parkinson's-like, and so it's this progressive degenerative disease, it's uh, characterized by uh, tremors, um, ataxia, uh, the onset of dementia, and premature death. Um, and it's about, um, in terms of, uh, of prevalence, it's about one, and we don't have great numbers, but the best guess we have is it's about one-third of males who carry the premutation for, uh, of, of this gene will, uh, by the age from age 50 on develop uh, FAXTAS and about uh, 6 to 8 percent of females. Um, and the reason that, and there are many reasons this is important, when we talk about Fragile X syndrome we say maybe it's 1 in 3,000, 4,000, it doesn't seem like a very high incidence. But if you look at people who carry the premutation, this is, these are the most recent findings from a, a population-based study. 1 in 151 females carries the premutation of this gene and 1 in 468 males. And so this is really a, a public health issue that I think of major importance. Uh, and this is just um, from some of the Hagerman's uh, recordings of individuals that have uh, fax tests, just to give you a sense of, of what it's like. So 
So this individual is just trying to write his name. You can see it kind of progressively gets away from him. So clearly problems with his gait. So he's just trying to touch his fingers together. And now just trying to stay within the lines. So I'll just give you kind of a sense of it. And again, this was really a condition that was discovered by um, our scientists. And I think what was really interesting about it, a lot of people were really skeptical about it. But a couple of things that I just want to mention about this, because I think this is, is, to me, really important. And it really has, well, three things that are important about this. Uh, this has really opened a whole new field of investigation that's really helping families right now. And, and it was a discovery, again, that our scientists um, or we're responsible for. The second thing is that it reminds us that this is, when we talk about con these conditions, and I'll return to this point later on, we often talk about kind of the individual that has a particular diagnosis and we focus our attention on them. And I think the real point, and this is really made dramatically in the case of Fragile X syndrome, that this affects families, this changes families. You think about Fragile X syndrome because it's an inherited condition. Many of the families that we see have multiple children who are affected by the condition. Um, we often have, in these families that we have parents that are worried about having fax tests and have, if in the case of moms, they may have other conditions as well, and then they may have a grandparent who's suffering at that point from that condition. And so this is kind of a multi-generational condition, and uh, to focus only on the child who has fragile X syndrome, I think, really misses the point in terms of how we can p potentially help families. The other thing that's important about this particular finding is that it's a great example of kind of the interplay between basic science and uh, clinical work and provision of care for families um, uh, kind of in a dramatic way in an individual, and that's uh, Dr. Ronnie Hagerman, who is uh, just an amazing uh, scientist and clinician who is really kind of the, one of the leaders in, in the world uh, in studying this condition. Um, and one of the things that kind of prompted her to even think about the existence of fax, fax tests was her clinical work. She would meet with families, uh, even though she's just a really well-funded scientist, she continues to see families in clinical practice all the time. And as she would meet with families and talk to them about how life was, she would find that a lot of these families that were seeing her because they had children with fragile X syndrome were talking about a lot of the problems that their, the, the grandfathers of the kids were having. They were having Parkinson's disease and things like that. And she just kept kind of hearing that over and over over again, and she would go to conferences, um, and, and I don't know how much of this is kind of an amalgamation of the facts, but at some conference she asked, uh, uh, it was a conference of families, how many of your dads have Parkinson's disease? And just a whole bunch of hands went up, more than you would expect kind of in the general population. And so she and Paul Hagerman and Flora Tassoni really followed up on that and now understand a lot about the neuropathology. And so again, I think um, it really talks a lot about the strength of the Mind Institute is we 
do clinical work and we do research, and I think we would be poor in many respects if we weren't doing uh, both of those things. So just um, I'll highlight a few of our other findings, and these are relatively recent findings um, uh, that have uh, been pretty high profile. Um, uh, David Amaral and Christine Wu Nordahl have uh, published a study recently that, that found that boys with a regressive form of autism display an increased brain size. And so these are boys that um, are developing typically and then have a loss of skills in early childhood, so that's the regression, and they, they have this different pattern of brain growth where their brains seem to be larger. Um, and so I think that that begins to give us some hints where we should begin to look to understand what causes, or one of the many causes of autism, or at least how it's manifested at the neurological level. At the same time, it raises other interesting complexities that we don't fully understand. So in girls with a regressive form of autism, they did not find that pattern of, of accelerated brain growth, and we don't really understand why. Um, another recent finding um, from uh, Irva hertz prochoda and her colleagues was that maternal obesity, diabetes, and hypertension during pregnancy are associated with increased risk for autism and other developmental problems, particularly language problems later. And again, that ri that's an important finding. It tells us something about where we should look for ultimate causes, but there's still a lot of work to be done to understand why we see, why, what are the risk factors? Why do we see these as risk factors for the onset of autism and other developmental problems? In our research, and I probably should have told you a little bit about my areas of interest. I really focus on language and communication challenges in, in young children and adolescents and young adults. Um, but we also are really interested in impacts of a variety of conditions on families and, and psychological well-being of parents in particular. Because as a parent, I think parents are really important to families. And the ultimate uh, outcomes for kids depend not just on things like clinical services and education. They depend a lot, they depend a lot on the family context. And so we've been concerned with the impact of these conditions on families. Families. And one of the things that we found is that in, in several studies is that mothers and fathers of youth with autism are at increased risk for depression. And that's relative both to the general population, but also to parents who are parenting children with other forms of condition, other conditions like Down syndrome and Fragile X syndrome. And for us, I think this is really concerning because it suggests that we need to do a much better job of supporting these parents and giving them resources so that they can be success, as successful as possible with their uh, children. Um, a few other findings uh, of note from re just over the last year. Um, uh, Tony Simon, who studies 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, um, has looked at some of the factors that impact kind of independent functioning, adaptive living, uh, adapting to daily life skills, and he was uh, interested in the extent to which IQ was a predictor. And what he found was that it was anxiety, not IQ, that really determined whether one was successful in daily life. Uh, since then, he's also looked at in a more nuanced way at cognition. And what he's been able to find is that some aspects of cognition combined with anxiety are really, really critical in determining successful adaptation for these youth and may probably predict kind of onset or risk for schizophrenia. And so he is in the process of establishing a clinic that will uh, to kind of take that approach and put that together to support families affected by this condition. Um, in our research, we've really uh, been uh, interested in kind of the, the overlap in symptomatology with autism and in Fragile X syndrome. And one of the things that we've found in our research, uh, and others have found this with looking at non-fragile X autism as well, is that many of the core symptoms of autism in fragile X syndrome abate with age. They improve with age, which I think is really good news for families. We, we looked at adolescence into young adulthood, and we found that um, communication impairments seemed to be better as children moved into later adolescence, uh, that the communication impairments were less severe. Social reciprocity improved, and the, so those impairments uh, abated to some extent. Um, interestingly, and we don't really understand why, the repetitive behaviors and, and restricted interests that are the other part of autism, those really were pretty consistent, at least over the age period we studied. But I think, uh, I think it's really important that there is improvement, uh, even probably in, in kind of less than optimal circumstances. And so I think that if we can understand what leads to that improvement, maybe we can exploit that in, in interventions. So we also, just because part of my job as uh, 
um, a director of the Mayan Institute. I can't decide if it's to brag or to cheerlead, so I'll do, I do a little bit of both. And so uh, in 2011, uh, every year Autism Speaks um, identifies the 10 most important scientific findings of that year. And in 2011, we had three of the top 10 from our scientists. One was the, the study by Sally Ozanoff on the recurrence risk that I mentioned. Another was uh, uh, Paul Ashwood was the lead author where he found that cytokines in blood uh, plasma were linked both to immune function, immune dysfunction, and behavior problems in autism. And then Rebecca Schmidt, who's here and who you'll hear from later today, was the lead author on a paper looking at uh, folic acid uh, metabolism and its role in um, risk for autism during early pregnancy. So uh, we are more than research. We also have clinical programs. I just want to tell you a little bit about our clinical programs. So uh, we provide services for uh, outpatient services uh, at the Mayan Institute for roughly 2,500 uh, individuals annually, and um, uh, we, we are so we are a small clinical operation. But one of the things that's absolutely critical to us is that the, these are uh, first of all these are first-rate clinical services, the best services you're going to find anywhere, uh, and um, that it, this is really critical to our mission for a number of reasons. As I mentioned, I think that we really owe it to families to help them now, just not to wait for ultimate cures. Um, I think that, and I think our clinical services do that in an amazing way. I think the other thing is that this is really kind of the face of the Mayan Institute. This allows us to have an impact and to be part of our community in a way that if we were only doing our basic science research, we wouldn't do. Um, and I think that that's critical. The other thing is that our clinical services really provide the context for us to test innovative interventions and, I'm gonna, and treatments, and I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. So even though we're, we're a very small clinical program, it is essential to what we do, and, and I'm really proud of the work we do clinically. So we have several different clinics. We have an assessment and diagnostic clinic, which is probably our largest in terms of the number of families that we see, and this is really uh, largely in the area of diagnosing um, children who uh, have a suspected autism diagnosis. Um, we um, do a wonderful job of, uh, of connecting these families to resources, uh, and increasingly, and I'll, again, I'll return to this, we're offering more in the way of interventions and treatments to help support families, but it's largely a diagnostic clinic. Uh, we have a social skills training, uh, social skills training program for uh, individuals on the autism spectrum. This is run by Marjorie Solomon, and this is just a great program. Uh, it runs uh, pretty much during the academic year, uh, kind of at the end of the day. And uh, if you're ever at the Mine Institute on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, kind of late in the day, it is just chaos in a really great way. Uh, there are three types of groups that are ongoing in the social skills program. One uh, it are kids on the spectrum, and so they are in social skills group to learn, I think, really critical skills that will allow them to be more independent uh, and to participate more in the lives of their community, things like um, how one makes eye contact, how one can hold a conversation, how it's important to ask questions about other people, and so on, and kind of talk about those things explicitly and give them practice in doing that, and also give them peer that they can interact with. Um, there's also a parent component, and so parents get to connect with other parents, and they also get strategies for supporting their sons and daughters. And then the third component of this is, is for siblings. And I think it's really critical that siblings understand more about their uh, siblings on the spectrum so that they can help support them and really kind of understand that they're an important part of the family and what makes their uh, sibling uh, really important and valued and special. And the reason that I think that that's absolutely critical is not that I think it's just a good thing to do, but one of the things we know from research is that as we follow families that have children with special needs, and as these families age, one of the things that parents are often concerned about is what's going to happen to my child if my child is not particularly independent in terms of care after I'm gone or when I'm no, able, no longer able to take care of him or her. And increasingly in the United States and in other societies, um, siblings step up to the plate and become the, the, the person who's responsible for care. But I think it would be really helpful if siblings were prepared for that. And so I think that's why that the sibling group is so critical uh, for um, our social skills program. We have an ADHD program for children and adults. 
And I think that's really unique because it does cut across the lifespan, both in terms of diagnosis, so for some individuals they're not diagnosed until they're adults, but also I think in terms of providing support, resources, um, and um, treatments. We have the Fragile X Research and Treatment Clinic that Dr. Hagerman leads, which really is uh, an internationally known uh, clinic, and we have families from all over the world who come for uh, diagnostics uh, and for uh, treatments of various kinds, pharmacological treatments, behavioral treatments, and uh, resources, and then we have a high-risk infant follow-up clinic uh, as well, which is really critical to what we do. It connects us to the hospital uh, it on the campus in important ways. So um, education and outreach at the Mayan Institute are a critical component of what we do. Um, and we have uh, the Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, which uh, Robin Hansen directs, which is a relatively new feature of the Mayan Institute. We're in year seven. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a really kind of a, a long-standing program uh, funded by the Administration on Developmental Disabilities, and there is at least one said uh, in every state and territory in the United States, um, because California is its own country, we have three of them, and, um, but uh, we're, we're the newest, uh, we're among the newest in the country, and it's really thanks to Robin's leadership that we have a said, and it's really critical to what we do, because I think it, it kind of gets back to that point that we have to help families now. The other thing that's really important about the set is that they're about partnerships and about inclusion. And their whole mission is to really engage in advocacy, uh, support programs, uh, education, research, all of which is going to increase the inclusion of people with uh, uh, disabilities of all types in their, in their communities. And I think that is just absolutely critical. And so it's really added an important dimension uh, to the Mayan Institute. And here are just a a few of the programs, and I won't go into any details because you're probably going to hear about these programs, but there is a certificate program in Autism Spectrum Disorder, which uh, is a collaboration with UCD Extension. There are a variety of different um, video series that are on our website, um, and this is one on 22Q, which probably is the only uh, comprehensive uh, video program uh, in, the, in the world on this condition, and it is just first rate. I've watched it three times and I've learned an awful lot about 22Q. It's just great, and we have other sorts of seri video series on there as well. We have uh, done a great job through the SED of having Spanish language uh, programs and materials like sibling workshops, online parent training modules, lots of informational resources, and the SED is, is continuing to expand those uh, all the time. Success Define, which is a wonderful program that really works with youth uh, that have special needs to define what success is for them and to help them engage in planning to allow them to achieve that, whether that's success in terms of post-secondary education, um, vocational sorts of options, or simply independent living. And then Think College, we are having a partnership, a leadership role there with a number of partners, and I was having a conversation with several people before that this is really kind of, I think, um, uh, an area that really needs attention and, and attention that's long overdue, and that's to provide post-secondary options for people with special needs, whether those are people on the autism spectrum. Uh, and I think it creates wonderful opportunities and, and partnerships with community colleges uh, and colleges and universities, and, and our set is really, um, I think, uh, kind of ahead of the game in, in recognizing the importance of this. We also have as, as a part of our education and outreach, and many of you know about the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders, and I was fortunate enough to, to be a part of that it's, uh, um, when I was at the University of Wisconsin. It's a uh, three university uh, program, it's, unfortunately it's coming to an end now, but it was uh, the Frank Portogram uh, Child Development Center at the University of North Carolina, the Waisman Center at the University of Wisconsin, and the Mind Institute. And um, it was really designed uh, to ensure that evidence-based practices um, are used and sustained in lots of different educational settings. And so it had a couple of different missions. One was, the, first of all, to identify evidence-based practices, because that's one of the challenges, I think, for families and for professionals, is what are, what are the practices that work? What are the things that really help improve outcomes for kids on the autism spectrum? And so the first function of this uh, consortium was to identify those evidence-based practices. Uh, and the second thing that they did was to kind of manualize them, if you will. So they created materials that told people what these practices were and how, the, how you could do them. Uh, and so there are these evidence briefs and video modules um, that are available free of charge online uh, to show people how to do things like video modeling and uh, pivot, pivotal uh, 
pivot response training uh, and other things like that. And here's just a few of those. And then the other thing that was really important is that rather than just kind of put the information out there, this consortium really worked hard to, to identify states where they could really make a difference. And so they worked with 12 states over the five years of the project. And what they did was identify kind of model sites where they could really uh, support the use of these evidence-based practices in, in um, preschool settings, uh, elementary, middle school, and high school settings, and then uh, do summer institutes to train people in those, and then to train trainers and the right technical assistance. So the idea was to kind of spread the use of these evidence-based practices. And so it's been an amazing uh, project uh, and that's really impacted practices in 12 states. And uh, so the Mine Institute was really a critical uh, component of that. So that's kind of where we've been, okay, um, as I want to talk a little bit about the future um, because, you know, these were all the good things they did before I came there, right? So I needed to figure out something that we need to do differently in the future or how to do more of what we're doing in, in different ways. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we're beginning to change and what our goals are for the future. So I mentioned that uh, this concept of translational research. And a lot of people use this concept, and this is really organized uh, the, the way the Mayan Institute thinks about its research mission right, really from the beginning. Um, and the National Institutes of Health, they've kind of touted this concept for a long time as well. But how people have traditionally thought about this concept of translational work is in the analogy of going from the uh, bench to the bedside. And so the idea was that we go from kind of basic science findings in the laboratory from the bench and we turn those into treatments for patients and uh, individuals affected by various conditions. And so that's the bedside. Um, but the problem is, is that's really not enough. I think there's another critical step that we often, as academics, don't do a very good job as, and we talk about that as moving from the bench to the bedside to the curbside. And what I mean by that is it's not enough to develop new treatments or new diagnostic practices if those aren't available on a wide-scale base basis in the community they're not useful. And the problem with that is oftentimes when we think about translational science, we often think about, well, I'll develop this new treatment and then I'll let other people figure out how to do it. The problem is, is that if you don't think about how you're going to scale up, how you're going to make this work in the community, in schools, in clinical settings that don't have a research institute behind them, um, in, community set, in community settings, Oftentimes, you're going to devise treatments that literally won't work anywhere other than in your laboratory. And so for us, we really want to impact families in the community. And so for us, we now talk about translational sciences involving this third element. And I think that that's absolutely critical. And so how are we going to do that? Well, a few things that we're going to do, and this is just uh, a kind of a, a little bit of a list, and, and I'm, if, at the end, if we have time for questions, you can ask me more about this. But one of the things that we want to do is expand our clinical trials program, and we can do that through partnerships. One of the things that we're really fortunate uh, uh, about being at UC Davis is it's an amazing university with wonderful resources that we can actually use to support our mission. And so there's something called a Clinical and, tra and Translational Science Center, which is a big r infrastructure for doing research um, that's supported by the National Institutes of Health, and we have a really good relationship with it, and they're going to help us with clinical trials. And so we have right now something on the order of about 14 trials going on looking at new medications to treat fragile X syndrome uh, and autism. And we're going to expand that program of, res of research to look at new uh, pharmacological treatments, and I think that's going to be really critical uh, over the next decade. We um, also want to integrate behavioral and pharmacological approaches to intervention because I think that ultimately um, for the drugs that we're looking at, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, the drugs that we're looking at to target particular symptoms of these conditions, these are not going to cure all of the challenges that we associated with conditions like fragile X syndrome or autism. I think these drugs were gonna, are going to help, but the truth is, is that we're going to also have to, and this is hard work to do, we're going to have to combine medications with really good environmental arrangements, whether that's in education, whether that's helping the family support development, um, and I think ultimately it's going to be this kind of hybrid approach that's really going to have the greatest impact, and so we're going to increase our efforts in that area. 
Uh, we're really going to encourage innovative research on the use of technology in the delivery of treatment services. And I think this is, is the answer to the, to the fact that we know, unfortunately, that more resources to do a good work and support and care for people with special needs, we're not going to get more resources. That's a reality. And I think the question is, is how can we think outside of the box to help families um, in more cost-effective ways, ways that are going to work, are going to be effective, but ways that are going to kind of maximize the resources we have. And I think technology is really underutilized in the field of developmental disabilities right now. We want to change that. Another thing that we're doing is, again, going back to the notion that translational science is a long process. As Robin mentioned, uh, she didn't say it in this way, but I'm kind of old, right? I've been doing this for a really long time, and there is a lot of work to be done. And I think that one of our responsibilities as scientists or clinicians is to make sure that the field continues, that we continue to make progress. And we have to be committed to mentoring the next generation of researchers. So we are in the process of starting a postdoctoral research program. We've actually applied for funding, and keep your fingers crossed, to create a, re uh, a training program to teach people how to do treatment research, how they can discover behavioral pharmacological treatments and ways of assessing treatment efficacy, um, because right now, we have a serious limitation, I think, in terms of the number of people doing treatment research. And then another next step for research, we're really fortunate we've just um, uh, had uh, recruited to our faculty uh, Dr. Jackie Crowley. She has been at the National Institutes of Mental Health for several decades, and she is the leading, I mean, easily the leading scientist using mouse models of social impairment to understand and uh, develop treatments for autism and other conditions. And so, uh, and this is one of the things that's really, I think, important and interesting about the Mind Institute is that we work with multiple kinds of model systems, if you will, um, to understand the conditions we study. So we certainly work with individuals and their families that are affected by these conditions. We also do a lot of primate work and, and, uh, and mouse and rodent behavior uh, models as well. And Jackie's really going to take us to the next level. And just to give you kind of one sense of the promise of this, um, this is a study that was just uh, published uh, just a few months ago in Science Translational Medicine. And what Jackie has done is she's uh, created kind of an inbred strain of mouse that has uh, three interesting core impairments. It has social impairments. And so, for example, these mice, these uh, BTBI, BTBR mouse, uh, mice, which are on this part of the slide, have social impairments like the following. They don't seem to be really interested in interacting with uh, novel peers, which is different than other mice. Um, they don't really um, uh, respond to kind of social overtures very well from other mice. Um, they also have what seem to be communica communication impairments, which is pretty tricky to measure in mice, right? So they don't have ultrasonic vocalizations under the same conditions as other mice. They don't respond to those kind of ultrasonic vocalizations in the same way as other mice. Um, and they also have what seem to be repetitive behaviors. So they do things like they'll have a lot of repetitive self-grooming behaviors. So they groom over and over and over again, or they also will engage in things like really digging holes over and over and over again. And so she's created this model that seems to have these three impairments that at least on the face, really seem to have something in common with autism. And so it provides us potentially a method for understanding more about autism and maybe working on developing treatments. Now, it is a long way to go from a mouse to a person. But you, if you think about kind of the first steps in developing new pharmacological treatments, you certainly don't start those with people, right? You have to really see if you can understand whether they're safe, whether they work in these model systems, and also you can understand kind of the mechanisms by which they work more easily in these kind of simpler organisms than in, in people. And so uh, in this particular study, Jackie uh, gave a particular drug, which I can never remember the name of it. They give these drugs these wonderful names, and this one was GRN529, right? Uh, surprisingly, I couldn't remember that. Uh, and what she did, so this is a, a drug that um, uh, kind of dampens or lowers uh, glutamate uh, in the brain, which is an excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. And part of the reason that she selected this particular drug and that targeted the glutamate system is because of work on Fragile X syndrome. Uh, a lot of research on Fragile X syndrome showed that the problem 
one of the problems of Fragile X syndrome is there is a protein that's missing that generally inhibits glutamate uh, activity in the brain. And when that protein is absent, glutamate kind of is at too high a level and things just kind of run amok, if you will. And so uh, there have been a number of trials to use these drugs that try and lower the glutamate, glutamate in Fragile X syndrome, and so she did this in these mice. And so these are kind of the, the neurotypical mice here, if you will, in terms of a number of social dimensions like uh, whether they uh, had nose-to-nose -nose sniffing, um, whether there was social contact, whether there was repetitive self-grooming and this repetitive digging. And in this study, what she found was when she gave this particular drug to these BTBI, BTBR mice, she lowered, and these are the dark blue, she lowered the levels of those behaviors. Um, I'm sorry, the light blue. So she increased the, the social behaviors that should increase, lowered the repetitive behaviors, and to almost the same levels as in the neurotypical mice. And so that's a really exciting find. Again, there's a lot of work to be done to go from that to treatments for autism, but it, it's certainly an exciting beginning. And we have had, I think with Jackie coming now, we're going to have more opportunities to kind of test out novel therapeutics. The other thing is that Mice turn out to be really important for also to, to test other kinds of interventions, not just drugs. And so you can actually look at the role of enriching the um, kind of the mouse environment, if you will, and the impact on some of these impairments as well. So this is really an exciting uh, addition for us, and I think this is an important part of our future. So uh, another uh, next step in terms of our clinical program is we really want to transform our role in delivering clinical services. And so we've kind of embraced this notion of a clinic without walls. And what I mean by that is uh, we really want to impact the, uh, more families. You know, 2,500 families, that's a nice amount, but more families need services. We want to do more. And the truth is there's only so much you can do if you're kind of more efficient. You know, so if we say to our clinicians, okay, so rather than seeing a family for 50 minutes, you see them for 45 minutes um, and, you know, don't take a bathroom break, right? Whatever. I mean, there's just so much you can, you know, so many families you can, uh, more families you can see by being efficient. And we are really efficient. Our, our uh, clinicians are as committed as any in the world. Um, but we're at some point, you know, seeing 2,600 families is still not enough. And so if we really want to see more families, if we want to impact more families, we need to think about providing clinical services in different ways. And so this notion of clinics without walls, I think, is really helping to organize our thinking about that as we move forward. What I mean by that is that we don't want to think about clinical services only in terms of our physical structure. That's not the limit of our delivery of clinical services. We want to impact people in the community. And so what we want to do is to begin to create partnerships in the community that allow us to share our expertise. Again, we have the best clinicians in the world. Um, and the, one of the things that we should do is to make sure those clinicians can influence other clinicians. And if you will, they can do things the Mind Institute way. And I think that's really going to be important. And so we want to create these partnerships. We want to consult and train train pediatricians in early diagnosis. We want to do more in terms of consulting and training school personnel and evidence-based practice, practices. We want to partner with other health care providers to offer screenings in the community, to do consults and the like. And so we really don't want to think about families having always to come to us. I mean, we can just share our expertise in other ways and really impact more and more families than we have. Using telehealth technology to extend our clinical reach and support our community partnerships is going to be absolutely critical. You know, the truth is there's just so many clinicians we have and so many researchers we have. If we really want to have more of an impact, I think we have to figure out how to kind of spread that through the use of technology. And so these are just some of the things that we're beginning to think about. We actually have a little pilot project that we're trying to start now in our clinics to look at whether we can do kind of the initial intake and interviews with families at a distance. It saves them time and travel and it saves us time, and so maybe we can be more, we can see more families that way. We want to provide consultations with uh, providers in the community through telehealth technology, and we can do that, and there are lots of, I mean, technology is so easy to use and so inexpensive, I think that's really going to be important. We can do trainings of a number of professionals, and I would really like us to begin to think of doing checkups. Rather than just have families come to us when they need a diagnosis or there's something that's gone wrong, I would like us to be more proactive and to really think about doing checkups through telehealth. You know, just checking in on a family at home through something like Skype, see how the child
child is doing, asking some questions, observing the child, just as a way of making sure things are still going well. And so I think that's going to be really critical. The other thing, and I really think, I, I'm really committed to this, is I really want to expand our funded research um, looking at uh, innovative clinical services. And what I mean by that, and this is, is kind of my vision here that I think is really, I hope uh, we're, we're going to be able to do more of. As I mentioned, our budget from the state is about $2.6 million, but our budget for research from NIH and other providers is about 10 times that, right? So if you think about it, if we as scientists can develop innovative interventions, whether those are educational, behavioral, pharmacological, and if those are research projects that we want to test out whether they work and, are, and show that they're efficacious, and we get funded to do that, then we can provide those treatment services for free. Wouldn't that be great? And from a family's perspective, all they want to do is find ways to help their family, help their children or their adolescents. And whether they're funded by the state as clinical service or funded by research is irrelevant to that. And so we are going to, you're going to see us doing more and more research on treatments so that we can not only learn more about the treatments that are effective, but that we can really impact families today and improve lives. In the area of education and outreach, I think we really need more programs and materials targeting diverse communities. And again, the SED has been really at the forefront here working with the Southeast Asian community to do a better job. And again, it's not just, as you know, any of you who, who work with uh, culturally diverse populations, it's not just a matter of translating. We really need to understand more about cultures and really get, uh, have relationships with people from uh, a wide uh, array of cultural backgrounds so that we can really understand their needs and, and meet those needs. And I think an area where we really want to do a better job is have partnerships with local public schools, and, and we're working on that through Dr. Peter Monday, who is our Director of Educational Research. So the other next step that's important is that we've always had this family focus, but I really want us to kind of intensify that in some I important ways. And the reason I think this is important, uh, and again, this is kind of my bias in the way that I look at life, is that really families are transformed by the child's neurodevelopmental disorder. And in fact, we can really kind of make a more general statement. Families are transformed by their children, right? We all, once we have a child, we are never the same. Okay, and that comes with both challenges and it comes with amazing joy as well. But, fam but families are transformed by children. And families provide the most important context for any child's development. That's whether you're a neurotypical child or you're a child with so-called special needs. Families are the most important context. And I think we have to recognize that, celebrate that, and also kind of use that as kind of a way of, of thinking about helping families. And so what we want to do more of in the future is we want to develop interventions that help parents act as advocates and agents of change for their children. I think that's going to be absolutely critical. We also want to develop programs that support all family members, siblings, grandparents, parents. I think everyone can play a role in ensuring optimal outcomes for kids. We want to develop pro uh, programs to address lifelong needs and transitions that families face. For an individual with special needs, they are part of that family forever. And life changes, and the needs of that individual and the needs of the families change over the life course as well. It's not just enough to, to intervene early and then let the family alone and hope for the best. We need to be there for families all along the way. And so what I'd like to do in my last few minutes, I think, is to talk about, uh, this is something out of our lab, because um, one of the things that I, I get to do and makes my job fun is not only do I get to do kind of the cheerleading and bragging in the administration, I also continue to be able to do research, which I'm really committed to, uh, and it gets, keeps me connected in really meaningful ways to families. So what I want to do is to tell you about a little research project that we've been engaged in for about the last year and a half um, that I think exemplifies some of what we want to do in our next steps in terms of kind of impacting families, uh, really supporting parents as agents of change, using telehealth technology, and doing more treatment research. And so this is a, a, a small research project, but it is just, uh, I have to say, it's been one of the highlights of, of my career. And, uh, and I also can't take all that much credit for it. So let me give credit to the appropriate people. So I uh, have the good fortune of having a, a lab director, Dr. Andy McDuffie, who has a PhD in special education and is a licensed uh, um, speech language clinician and had kind of a history before a PhD of working in schools. And uh, she and I worked together at Wisconsin, and she was 
was nice enough to come with me to California, and uh, is really she is really the the uh, heart, soul, and brains of this project. In addition, we have an amazing clinician, Ashley Oaks, who uh, works more hours than I can count on this intervention to help families. And we also have uh, two students from Sac State who are just integral parts of the of the project as well. As well. Monica Ma and Alex Stewart have just been amazing in this project. Uh, and this is a project that's funded by the National Fragile X Foundation. And so this is an opportunity for us to provide treatment services for families at no cost. In fact, we have the great good fortune of being able to pay all of their expenses for travel, which turns out not to be a trivial thing. In this, in this current iteration of the project, we have 12 families enrolled, and they come from uh, 11, 10 states in the United States and Canada. And so we're able to bring them in for this intervention, and, uh, and it's all free. And so I think that's the model that we want. Wouldn't that be great if we could have families come to us and it doesn't cost them anything and they get treatment services. And so this is really a great model uh, and so we'd like to do more of this. And so what we're interested in is increasing verbal responsivity and we're only focusing on, on moms at this point but this is certainly uh, a, an intervention we want to extend to dads, grandparents and perhaps even siblings. And so we focus on this concept of verbal responsivity. And what verbal responsivity is, it's talking about the child's focus of attention. So talking about what the child is doing and engaged in and interested in, responding contingently to child communication, so kind of keeping the conversation going and let, letting the child initiate, respond in affectively positive ways, respond in a developmentally progressive fashion, so you kind of match what you say and do to the child's developmental level, and you really want to encourage child communication. Now, that doesn't sound particularly sophisticated, does it? But the truth is, is that this is a lot um, harder to do than you would think. And so there's a lot of variation among parents in any population you look at to, in the extent to which they do this. And so what we're trying to do is to get parents to increase and intensify their use of these verbally responsive strategies. The other thing that's really critical is, as I mentioned, we all are changed by our children, right? We all adapt to our children. And what we've seen in families of, of uh, children that have special needs is that the families adapt and continue to adapt over time, but in some cases those adaptations are not ultimately what's going to be optimal for language development. And so what we try and do is refocus families, show them how they can do these strategies that we think are going to optimize language outcomes in kids. And right now we're, this intervention is focused on uh, children on the autism spectrum or children who have fragile X syndrome between the ages of two and four and have really minimal language, maybe a few words or really uh, no words at all. And um, we have seen from research on a number of populations, whether we're talking about typically developing children, children with Down syndrome, children with Fragile X syndrome, children with, uh, with an autism spectrum disorder, parents who do more of these strategies, their children develop language faster and have better language outcomes. And so the, we know these strategies work. It's a question of how can we help support parents' use of them. And then the other thing, you know, so we went into it kind of just thinking, well, we're going to teach parents how to do these. And, and this was where, you know, my limitations kind of came in. And I thought, well, this is going to be a language intervention. Well, it turns out you can give parents all these wonderful strategies, but if their kids don't want to play, if their kids are tantruming, you can't do it. And so we really had to add this other component where we had to really help parents decrease child challenging behavior and increase their engagement in play and increase their engagement with parents. So uh, again, we're focused on mothers of young children with minimal language, uh, and these are kids that have either Fragile X syndrome or autism. And we're trying to enhance responsivity in two types of interaction contexts, play and routines. And we've chosen these because these are really the, the areas where we see typically children learning a lot about their language and how to communicate. And we really want to impact kind of, we want to change the interactions of these families in ways that get sustained. So we want to try and change how they interact kind of in realistic routines, not in, ther in kind of therapy-based routines. And so we teach them how to do these strategies in, in play. And then routines are things that are, that are recurring, that you do every day, that kind of happen in pretty much the same way. Um, and there turns out that 
that the great opportunities for children to learn language, and, and I'm sure any of you who have kids know how important routines are. Things like reading a book to your child, and they want to read the same book over and over and over and over again so that you can't even stand it anymore, and, but you can never skip a page because they know. Well, kids are really sensitive to those routines, and if you think about it, what it really does is because they're predictable and the content is understood, it gives kids a chance progressively to pick out new things, new words, to understand new language. And so those routines are critical, but not just kind of book reading, but they're also things like changing uh, diapers, going to the potty, having a bath, all of those things happen in the same way all the time. And so those are wonderful contexts for teaching language and there's good evidence that that's where kids pick up so much of their languages in these routines and in play. So that's what we focus on. In terms of the intervention, there really are three components. We have face-to-face -face didactic sessions and so parents come to us once a month and we have these wonderful PowerPoints that explain these strategies. We kind of go through with them. There are all these video, embedded video examples so they can learn these strategies. And then while they're with us we, uh, and their child is there, they interact with their child either in a routine or typically in play and we kind of hover and coach and we give them, we give them feedback about here was an opportunity where you could have used these, this strategy. Here's a great use that you did of that strategy. Here's where you, maybe you, used, you didn't use the strategy and so on. And then the other thing, and this is really critical, one of the problems with doing any sort of behavioral intervention is making it kind of a high enough dose, giving parents enough practice, enough support so they can really engage in these things in ways that, so it becomes kind of second nature to them. And because these are families that are coming from all over the country, we can't have them come, you know, like three times a week, right? Um, we have a travel budget, but it's not that big. And it's a big burden on families to travel uh, with young kids. And so we do, uh, once a week, we essentially Skype with them. So we give them a laptop, we send them home with it, and they, we set up a time, and once a week, they turn the laptop on so we can kind of peer into their home, and we talk to mom, and then they interact around a routine or play, and we coach them as they're doing it. And we tell them when they're doing it right, or here's something you can do, and the parents love it. So where we're at now is can we, how much can we reduce and pull back from the face-to-face, -face, um, and how much can be Skype? But I think this is a great example of now here, again, we're doing treatment, it's free, we're trying to reduce the burden of travel, we're trying to use technology, and I think this is really the way that we should start to think about all clinical services. Um, the other thing I can say about this is that it's really, again, going back to the, the notion of the uh, founding families, um, it's really multidisciplinary. So we've integrated speech language pathologists and applied behavior analysts within our same team, and it works really well. And uh, I want to give you, I want to end with just a few um, examples of, uh, so you can see kind of the flavor of this intervention and how it works. And we have several papers we're working on now and I can tell you right now we are changing parent behavior in really dramatic ways and the parents and this is one of my concerns is what we're doing is we're tr basically turning parents into therapists right and you know it's hard enough being a parent without being a therapist so I was a little concerned about this but what the families have told us is that they now feel empowered they understand how to help their children and they really do feel empowered and they feel that they are now the most important really the most important people in their children's lives and I think this is really critical if we want to sustain this. So it's just a few examples. So I'll, I'll tell you about this in a second. I'll just let you watch this. Oh, Trinity, goodness. Oh, you. Are you stacking? Stack. Okay, so that's a strategy. <laughs> and so the strategy is play face to face. And one of the interesting things about that is that for so many of our moms, in this case, this is a mom of a young child with autism. When we would have the parents come in the, and with their children and ask them to play, often, to, almost always, Mom would face this way, the child would be in another part of the room and face this way. These are great moms. These are, they're not ignoring their children, but what they've learned is their children don't like intrusions on their play. And so we have to kind of help reframe the interaction. And so what that mom was doing is what she had learned in the, kind of our first lesson, one of the things she learned in our first lesson. This is something called descriptive talking. And so the idea is, is you want to talk about, you want to give children, if they're really interested in something, give them the words for it then. That's when they're ready to learn, right? So here's an example of descriptive talking. Green, Green. red, blue, yellow. Okay, hit one. 
example of a distance session. So how the distance sessions work is again, we're just turning on these laptops that we give, we kind of loan to parents and then uh, you're going to hear Ashley Oaks, our speech language clinician, kind of telling the mom what to do. And so this is just to give you a sense of the distance session. Okay, okay. Maybe you can tell them one more pat a cake and then get them two other toys and offer a choice. Okay. One more pat a cake and then play with toys. Very nice first Ready, set, Go! Patty cake, patty cake, bake yours a bit. Bake me a cake as fast as you can. Roll them up, roll them up, throw them in the van! Yay! Time for more toys. Let's find a toy. Good, why don't you get two and bring them right over to him? Oh, that was great, really nice. <laughs> yeah, we'll do tickles in a minute. You want train or ball? And so one of the things that we're working on there, this is where the challenge behavior comes in. He really likes to do that patty cake thing. And so the talking about it, because he's interested in it, is great. But the problem is, is that you also need your children to look at other things, right, engage in the world. And so we give them strategies for kind of widening the things they're interested in. And so giving her strategies to engage him in, in toy play was really important. Now here's an example. This is kind of a before and after I'm going to give you. So just watch. This is at home with uh, in the, this mom. So what he, this is a really long sequence and, and what you can't see too well is that what he's trying to do is to bite mom's feet. And this goes on for a long time. And the other thing that you can't really tell is that the room is a little bit chaotic, not in, in a way that it's messy, but the mom would say that what she does, she doesn't really know what he likes to play with, so she leaves all the toys out. Okay? And now here's after, I think, three or four sessions. Ball. 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 Nice. Good ball. during the play. Green ball. Green ball. <laughs> Roll ball. ball. That's great that he models or imitates your model. Good job, Sean. Nice job sitting down, Sean. Okay. Nice. Very nice positive touch. First of all, there's a lot of good language, okay, about what he's doing. It's also not so chaotic and her feet are safe, right? <laughs> uh, but you know what the key is, is not just the table. She has all the materials. She controls the materials. They're all underneath the table. And so that gives her more control of the environment. Also sets up opportunities to communicate because he can't just take something. He has to ask for it. And so that's really critical. And it's a much nicer interaction. Here's another before and after. Look at this nice tower. This will make a lot of noise if you knock it down. Look at this. Uh, like that. No? Nothing? Okay, so that's not following the child's lead, right? I mean, he's doing what he's doing, she's doing what she's doing, and she's just hoping he's going to be interested. All right? Again, these, these are wonderful moms, but they've adapted to their children in perfectly sensible ways. And all we're doing is to kind of help give them the strategies to do things that will allow the uh, kind of a more optimal environment for the kids. And so this is this, uh, the same mom, I think about uh, maybe a month, two months later. And this is in her home. Great taking a turn there and describing what you did. The police car! Yellow star! Yeah! Red fire truck! Two trains left. Blue train, red train, red train! Nice job just giving him one. And blue train. Goes in. You put all in. You put all in. 
It's a much better interaction. She enjoys it more and certainly has more opportunities to learn language. So let me just end by saying, you know, we do have challenges and I think, I just want to mention three of these. One is state support for our infrastructure. You know, these are tough fiscal times and I think the state of California has been amazingly supportive of the Mayan Institute, but we worry about that. Uh, and I think we all, all, any of us who are in state agencies or in, in any sort of uh, a provision of services to families, I think we all worry about that. The other thing is because we depend so much on the National Institutes of Health for our funding, and unfortunately their uh, funding is, is continuing to decline, uh, and I'm particularly worried about the next generation of scientists. Uh, and just to give you a sense of that, when I got my first grant way back when, uh, the National Institutes of Health was funding the top 28 to 29 percent of the applications. They're now funding about the top 10 percent of applications. So this is a really challenging time to get funded, particularly to our new scientists, and I'm concerned we're at risk of losing the next generation of scientists that are really going to complete the bench to bedside to curbside for us. And lastly, I think uh, we're all struggling with the increased demand for autism clinical services. The increasing prevalence uh, it just means we need more families need services and I think if we, we're not going to have more resources. I think we need to think about innovative ways in terms of embedding research, partnerships in the community and, and technology. Otherwise, I think we're going to really fail families in a big way and I'm really concerned about that. Um, nonetheless, I think these are also opportunities and so to end on a positive note, I think we have ways of addressing all of these concerns and I think the Mind Institute, uh, and I'm very biased, is really in the best position in the country to do this. And so, uh, thanks very much. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.